come to from school. Amen. Let's go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Matthew 23, brethren. We're going to go to verse 23. The Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of men and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain in a gnat, and swallow a camel, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening, Lord, and thank you for this chance for us to come together here to learn more about you and your word. And Father, I just ask you to fill us with the Spirit of God so that the brethren here can receive something I'm going to say this evening about gnats and camels. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for the salvation that you gave through your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And notice here the Lord, he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, and what he has to say here isn't too good. Yeah. He seems to be bringing out a problem with them, something that they're doing wrong, and for that reason they're representing God in a wrong way. Yeah. And you might read this and wonder, what does this have to do with me? <coughs> the most I know about cumin is that I use it sometimes as a spice when I cook. Well, I know we do, it's just the Hispanics, we definitely <coughs> do that a lot. Okay, It's that, that orange-colored stuff, kind of like turmeric. Kum, really good stuff. Okay. But he's talking about it as if it has to do with some kind of tithe. Okay. And then he mentions some spiritual things that we see here, and then he goes on and says to them that they strain in gnats and swallow camels, and you know, as Gentiles are like, what is what is this talking about? But they knew exactly what he was saying. Okay. They had a clue. And the reality is, brethren, most people today have the same problem. Okay. It's not really exclusive to the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, and so what I'd like to do this evening is show why that is, and hopefully we can get a little more understanding on, I guess this is two thoughts, okay, here and what the Lord said. Okay, so I guess I'm going to take an hour, right, ma'am? Half an hour per thought. All right. Anyway, okay. So we'll start from the bottom and go up, and first we'll look at these animals because it's kind of important to understand that what he's saying here actually has more meaning than just the usual, uh, I guess, hyperbole we would think. Okay. Let's look at gnats first. Well, what's a gnat? Okay. Most of us know that gnats are flies, basically. Okay. If you had to pick what kind of fly, this would be more fruit fly than other types. Okay. They tend to be the really, really small ones. Okay. And believe it or not, the Bible talks about flies. Okay. Go to Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11. The Lord referred to gnats because he wanted these scribes and Pharisees to think about something here. He wanted them to reflect on his statement about tithing. We're going to get there in a minute. And connect that with the gnat. Leviticus 11 and verse 21, the Bible says, Yet these may eat of every flying, creeping thing that goeth upon all four. This is God talking. He's telling uh, the Jews, what they can eat, yeah. which have legs above their feet to leap withal upon the earth. Even these of them you may eat, the locust after his kind, and the ball locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind. So notice that there are flying, creeping things, also known as insects, but that's what the Bible calls them, yeah. that the Jews were able to eat. Yeah. Now, I have a question for anybody here. Okay. Have you guys ever eaten a chocolate-covered insect before? Yeah. Yes. Anybody? No. No. Amen. Oh, Carol says no. Well, she, she's actually you know, somebody who's obeying Scripture. You see that? No. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It depends on the insect. I've eaten a chocolate-covered beetle. I guess I could do that according to Scripture. Now, if you ate flies, that's kind of... Gross. Oh, amen. All, bug, all bugs sound gross to me. <laughs> well, you know what? There was one time where I'd say amen to that. The, the Beatles are okay. I don't think it'd be my first choice. Okay. But if I was like John the Baptist, I guess I'd have to eat what I got, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you take what you can get out in the desert, if you will. He ate locusts and honey, for those who don't know. Okay. So there's some good ones there. But then in verse 23, Matthew 23, 23, Leviticus 11, 23. Okay. 
But all other flying creeping things, that includes them gnats, which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. And for these you shall be unclean, whosoever toucheth the carcass of them shall be unclean until the even. And notice that God is connecting an uncleanliness with these other insects. You might be saying, well, why is God being so prejudiced and biased? Okay? How dare he make this separation? Okay, but I think many of us know that flies can carry diseases. Okay, you ever heard of malaria? Yeah. You ever heard what fleas and ticks do to dogs and things of that sort? And also to you, okay, if they bite you. There's a reason for this that goes above and beyond just arbitrary things. God knows what he's talking about. And maybe he didn't explain all the signs, but he told his people, you need to stay from, away from these things. Don't eat them. Okay, I know. But notice that God actually took the time when he was right there in front of the scribes and Pharisees to say that they're straining at these things. Okay? Like they're getting caught up in something that's unclean, something that's small and tiny that shouldn't be the focus of their ministry. See where I'm getting at? Okay. But they're stuck there. Many of us know of the word Beelzebub. Okay. Beelzebub, I guess you'd say in English. Okay. Beelzebub, in Spanish. But that's referring to the Lord of the flies, also known as the devil. Notice that he's the Lord of things that are unclean. Okay. And the Lord is connecting something he mentioned in verse 23 to those gnats that they're stringing. They're caught up in something. Yeah. So much so is what you'll find is that many people today will focus on small little things of ritual and doctrine and get lost in it. Yeah. <laughs> they forgot about the forest when they have focus on that small little tree. That's the usual statement. Yeah. And these scribes and Pharisees, like most people, get caught up in that and think there's value there and miss the big picture. Okay. When you strain at these little things, especially when they're not good things, okay, it's not a good idea. And so we see that gnats don't seem to be that good at all. But what about camels? Okay, because people use camels, they seem pretty useful, don't they? Okay. I know people have eaten camel as well. I've never had that. Okay, I've never had that luxury. I don't know about you. Okay, I've eaten shark, I've eaten some weird stuff. Okay, but not, not camel. And what does the Bible say about that? Same chapter in Leviticus. Go to verse 3. Verse 3. And the Bible says, Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, the beasts that shall eat. Yeah. So two requirements here. Their, their hooves have to part. They have to have a divided hoof that makes them cloven-footed, and they chew the cud. Okay, well, what's going on with camels? Verse 4. Nevertheless, these shall you not eat of, of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof. So if you have one of the two, that's, you're unclean. you got to have both. Okay? Sometimes you can have one thing right, but you're missing the other, and if you don't have both, it isn't right. It's still unclean. That's going to get into this message. Okay, keep that in mind. As the camel, because he cheweth the cud, so he's chewing up, what would be, I guess, good food, you know, some herbs and grains to say you're somebody who's religious and you're chewing up some good Bible. You heard that Jesus Christ was God, for example. And you're chewing that up. Verse 4. But divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. Okay? You hearing the word and being a non with joy wasn't enough for you to make the decision to go on your knees. Okay? Make that division between you and God and say that you don't know him so you can get saved. Recognize that you need mercy from God, for example. And these camels, okay, even though they did partake of something that was decent, it wasn't enough to make sure that they were clean. They're still unclean. Still consuming them is bad. Okay? So when God was referencing these gnats and these camels, he was telling this to the Pharisees because they knew Leviticus. And they knew he was talking about things that were unclean. He was directly commenting on what they were doing and saying it was wrong. Okay. Now, now the question is, how exactly? Go back to Matthew 23. Okay. Matthew 23. So now we read the verse, but what, we're gonna, what I'm going to show you here is what each little phrase refers to. Matthew 23, at least to my estimation. Okay. Preacher can correct me. Matthew 23 and verse 24 the Lord starts off saying, you blind guides, which strain at a gnat. Now, what is the straining at a gnat talking about? Go back to verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And the Bible has a format called ABAB -A -B format. You can use that to get definitions of words or connect phrases. 
Okay. In verse 24, you have strain in that. That's A. What's the A in verse 23? For ye pay tithe of men and anus and cumin. Right there. Okay. So they were focused on something called the tithe. Okay. And back then it wasn't just the money that you made at work. Okay. There was also food items. Okay. Meats, all kinds of things. And you can kind of understand the scribe and Pharisee because their livelihood depended on what the people gave them. Okay. If you go back in the law, that's how they were fed. The sacrifices weren't just burned on an altar. They actually had to consume pieces in order to complete that actual sacrifice, that offer. Okay. That was their responsibility sometimes to actually consume it. Aaron figured that out and made sure no other people got destroyed after his sons got burned by the strange fire. Okay. He went over there and instead of crying for his kids, he went and consumed. And, the, and Moses and the Lord, they were happy with that because he was recognizing the importance of him bearing their iniquity. Okay. And so, yes, the, they had a responsibility to it. You can see why they care. But what ends up happening is that when we focus on things that matter to us and actually affect our livelihood, we get caught up in that. And we omit the weight of your matters of the law. Okay? They were straining at the net. I'm pretty sure that they were getting on people's cases when they said, wait a minute. I just weigh this in the scale. It's a little off. I need you to put another piece there. Okay? Give me some more cumin. I don't have any more. It doesn't matter. Then I don't want your sacrifice. This is the kind of stuff that was happening. Yeah. Now that was back then. What about today? Yeah. I remember a time yeah, where I was told, okay, let's say I was eating the Eucharist, okay, and I chewed it and some of it came out of my mouth. I was told I had to get down there and lift that thing up. It's a body of Christ. Okay. That's pretty picky. That floor is nasty. Okay. People have been walking on that thing, but this priest is telling me that's the way it is. You better get down there and pick that up. Okay? And some of you are like, did you do that? I was a kid. I did what I was told. Okay? Maybe I was more apt to eat dirt too. I don't know. Okay? That's, that's another question for another day. Yeah? But the reality is it wasn't a good idea. Okay? And yet because there was some pickiness there, if you will, I went ahead and did that. Now bring it up to when, in my case, when I grew up. I started focusing on certain things more than the spiritual. Okay? Get caught up in how much money I'm making. How can I make, count my pennies and all this? Okay? Straining at a gnat. See? What about swallowing the camel? Okay? Go back to verse 23. Verse 23. Swallow a camel is the B phrase. After the comma and cumin. And, so the next phrase, have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Okay. See that? And so when they were focusing on their tithe and caring more about that than what actually mattered, it affected what they were receiving. Even though they followed all the rules and they actually measured the scale, they had a just weight, in God's eyes, none of that counted. Because they forgot the important thing. Judgment, mercy, faith. Yeah. Now, now keep in mind the difference in size between a gnat and a camel. Yeah. And God is telling these people, look, you're so focused on this, and you forgot this big part, and now it's all dirty and unclean. Because camels, yeah, they do a little bit right, but they're missing the other piece, and they're unclean. See that? Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up, brethren, is because we need to recognize in our own lives the fact that we can't just be doing rituals here. Okay? Preacher always says, that if, if it's not in your heart to give, don't even bother. It's not going to be worth anything. You might make yourself feel good, okay? And, and you know, maybe if it was Joe O.C. behind you, he'd get excited, you filled his pockets, okay? But, but God ain't going to be happy, okay? And most of the brethren here wouldn't be happy or they wouldn't want that from you. They want you to do right. Okay? And they understand the weightier matters of the law, and they understand that your heart has to be behind it. Okay? And so the Lord is talking to them and trying to get this truth to them and also to the people around so they can recognize that they've been messing up. Okay? They, they know all the nitty gritty. Okay? They sit at Moses' seat. They get all this stuff. Okay? But they don't have the spiritual. Now go back to verse 23, because there's actually more there. There's a colon after that. 
The Lord continues, These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. You see that? These, what are the these? They should have done judgment, mercy, and faith. Yeah? But because they did it, they end up leaving the part that they were straining at undone. Okay? It's still unclean. It's worthless. Even though they were so meticulous. Yeah? How many people care about the works of righteousness that they do in their religion or in their practices or in their customs or whatever you want to call it? Yeah? And yet God ain't in it at all. See? They ought to have focused on those three things listed there. And because they didn't, even though they went through all that work, they may have committed all their energy and all their life to that kind of stuff. To God, it's, it's just junk. And you swallowed a camel. And good luck with that, because my mouth ain't that big. Okay, I can't really do it. Okay, that's, you, I guess God is trying to say they're choking on themselves spiritually. See that? Go to 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3. Here, Paul brings up a very basic truth. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. This is our ministry, brother. And Paul says, Who also, this is God, it's the sufficiency of God that he's able to do this, he says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. That's what we're supposed to minister. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And you know what happened to them historically? They were straining at that and that. They were focused on the leather of the tithe, and they killed it. Their work was worthless. Okay. They totally forgot about the spiritual, and there was no life behind it. Okay. Now, what's sad about that is that what they did there doesn't just affect them. It affects others, because they're the example. They're the guides. Okay. And if the blind need the blind, both are going to go in the ditch. Likewise, we have the same responsibility. Okay. Now, I'm all about the letter. Everybody in here knows I'm all about every single word of God being pure and all that, and I'm serious about every word. That's a good thing, okay? But I better be serious about God who wrote this thing first. That makes sense. Okay? That's why I'm always messing with preaching. I'm like, ah, I could strain a gnat's preacher. I just better not swallow a camel. Okay, in the process. It's when you do that, you got a problem. Most bad doctrine ignores simple things. That's swallowing a camel. Isn't that right? Yeah. That's just a fact. Okay. We were just talking about hypers before this message. They're swallowing a huge camel. Okay, with basic reading, to be honest with you. Okay. But they get caught up in the knee okay. And so, Christian, the Lord is trying to warn us here in Matthew 23 that we need to make sure that our motivations are in check. Okay. How do we do that? Let's consider the weightier matters of the law, though. What were the three things he mentioned? He mentioned judgment, mercy, and faith. Let's start with judgment, because okay? he started with it. Usually we go backwards if you think about it, right? We start with faith, then we talk about mercy, and then learning to judge. But he's talking to leadership, and so he started this way. Yeah? Judgment, why? Because we're not to judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment, the Bible says. Judge in accordance with the word. Go to James 2. James 2. And you know the person that they forgot to judge, because you might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, weren't they following the law when they were taking the tithe? Okay, well, they forgot about yours truly. James 2, they were focused on what they were going to get from so-and-so and forgot about themselves. And that's why they're, they were the Lord's enemies at that moment, clearly. Why else would you be God's enemy? Okay, it's because you don't believe them about yourself. James 2 in verse 12, James says, So speak ye and so do. Okay, talking about the Ten Commandments, you speak them, live them, live that law. Okay? As they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Yeah. This is the law of liberty. Use it as a mirror. Reflect on your spiritual condition, Christian. Really look at yourself and make sure you're right with God. Okay? In the model prayer, the model prayer, yes, starts out praising God because of His holiness, Heavenly Father, right? And the next thing you should do is ask God to forgive you for your sins. Okay? Clearly, reflect. Okay? Because your sins will separate them from you and you won't hear you, the Bible says. So have short accounts. Okay? 
Likewise, when you're performing a work, make sure it's done in accordance with the law. Okay? Make sure it's done right. Because now that you got your heart right, now you want to do the words right. Okay? And what we find today is many brethren who are saved and they got a heart for God. You see, they're trying their best, but the one thing they won't do is receive this book. Okay? And they're swallowing little pieces of camel every time they do a work for God. It's not a good look. Okay? It's a sad reality. Some of them get puffed up and then they forget that their works now are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. They just got totally messed up. Just like the Pharisees. No matter how picky it was, I can appreciate people's desire to do things properly in accordance with the rules. Yeah. I'm all about that, you know, soldier and all that good stuff. You know, I used to follow rules. Okay? But if... I'm just doing them and going through the motions, and it's not real here. Does it really matter? Okay. Maybe to the person that you know that's your leader. I mean, he, that's what he cares about, right? Okay. But not God, because God's not a God of the mind. He's a God of the heart. Okay. God is not a pragmatist. God is not about you. The end justifies the means, any of that trash. Okay. God is about you being faithful from here. That's what he's about. And so the first thing you should do is use that same law to judge yourself and make sure you're in the right place before you apply that law to others. Proper judgment. They forgot. Okay. Likewise, you have mercy. We're in James 2. Go to verse 13. Right after that, the Bible says, For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. And what you were reading in Matthew 23 was the Lord having no mercy on them in the sense that he was ripping them a spiritual one right there with the word and tearing them apart in front of people. Okay. And the majority of them got embarrassed. A few of them might have woke up. Praise God. But the rest of them were all concerned about their character. And how dare you embarrass me and talk to me like that. I got rope. Okay, I'm doing good. Okay. That's most people, right? You bring out the sword of the spirit. You give them just a simple Bible verse. Hey, you're a sinner. Okay, can't save yourself. How dare you tell me that I can't do anything for myself and my religion? Okay, that's my paraphrase. Basically, what everybody says, I'm good. Right? Okay. That's not meekness. Okay. Meekness recognizes that in front of a holy God, you have no reason to defend yourself. You should accept His judgment and receive it and allow it to cleanse you. I always say the first time you were meek is when you realize that you were guilty before God because of your sin. And so you turn to him for salvation. That was the first time you were truly meek in your entire existence. Uh, and here we say, but mercy rejoiceth against judgment. They were quick to strain over the tie. They were quick to focus on other people and say, you didn't give enough. They weren't merciful to them. What if they couldn't give? You should be able to understand and have compassion. That wasn't happening historically. Okay. Spiritually, you got all kinds of situations that are similar to this. Okay. I heard somebody preach about Harold Camping telling some uh, some mother who called him on the radio or whatever, asking about their child if they're saved. And he said, "No, they're in hell. Okay, the, the baby died." That is that is exactly what this is talking about. It's just, not only is it bad doctrine, it's just horrible. He said that over the couldn't say, you know, let me, let me get back to you at least before he drops that kind of bomb. No, I'm just going to, I'm Harold Camp and I'm the man. Yeah. How many times did he talk about the rapture happening and failed? Yeah. Most of you guys know you've been hearing this guy here and there longer than I've been alive. So I, I've heard at least more than twice. He's messed up. Okay. Anyways. Enough about him. The point is you're focusing on that. You're looking at what others have failed to do. You're quick to judge them. You're quick to take the same scripture you're supposed to judge yourself with and apply it and cut somebody else up. Yeah. Instead of correcting yourself. The one person you seem to be merciful towards is you. Just ignore all your problems and all your inability to actually fulfill the law properly. Okay? Because, you know, I'm a Pharisee and I'm publican and I tithe, you know, once every week and all this and I fast twice a day. Everybody heard that parable before? Okay. But then the publican was like, be merciful to me, a sinner. See, that? there's a difference there. Okay. The Lord didn't come to call the righteous. He came to call sinners to repentance. Where are you? Okay. If you're good, then it doesn't matter what God wants to offer you. He'll never actually take it out of his hand, even though he puts it right in front of your face. Because okay? you don't think you need it. 
getting caught up in gnats and swallowing the camel of, etern of eternal life so you can receive eternal death, I guess. That's what you want. Okay. And last but not least, faith. We all know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why we usually would flip that and start first if we were trying to teach somebody. Okay. So you want people to come in here in order to learn how God is merciful and compassionate. And so when that time comes to judge righteously, you do it in truth and in love. But these leaders should have known better, so the Lord does it the other way, because they are called to be faithful. Because they apparently had the faith, right? They're the, the Jewish leadership. I mean, they got the Word of God, right? Okay. I got my phylactery. I memorized all these verses. Oh, my goodness, I'm the man. Okay. Give me a break. Go to, go to Micah 6. Micah 6. I, I probably could quote part of this, but I'd rather read it as it is. Micah, one of the minor prophets with a major message here. Micah 6 and verse 8. Yeah. Micah 6 and verse 8. The Bible says, He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly, with thy God. See that? If you do justly towards yourself, you're going to love mercy because mercy was applied to you by the God of the universe. And so you're going to want to be merciful to others. And that's going to keep you humble because you're going to seek God's face to help you do that every step of the way. See? If you follow this verse to a T, this is the key to becoming faithful, just like your God. That's why God put it that direction. <clears throat> He's dealing with leaders who should already know how to judge and always put mercy above judgment so that they can be faithful and they're failing at that. Okay? As mature brethren, that order applies to us. We're called to be faithful at this point. You should already have enough faith. How many people read their Bible once in their life? Everybody here raised their hand. I already know. Okay? At least once. You got plenty of faith in there. Okay? Start actually applying it. Okay? He wants people to be faithful now. In Psalm 89, verse 1, I'll just read it. The Bible says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Colon, what are those mercies? With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. The key to being faithful, the key to being complete in God's eyes and having all the weightier matters of the law fulfilled as you're focusing on a little net of doctrine is by telling people about your God. And saying, thank you, Lord, for providing these things. Huh? I appreciate you, God, for allowing this tie to exist so I can receive something. Okay, Help me to properly judge when I'm dealing with this person. Maybe they're in a situation they can't give. I'm going to be compassionate. That's what they should have been doing. That's faithfulness. They weren't doing it. And spiritually, we as Christians today should do the same. We have to be willing to reflect on the grace we received at Calvary's cross, allow it to reflect on ourselves daily so we can die to ourselves. And then when we work with other people and they start getting mouthy with us when we give them the gospel or whatever, we can just take it in stride. Okay? <coughs> because we remember, we were like that once. And our God took time with us through somebody else. Now it's our turn to be faithful and to do the same. Because the last thing you want to do okay, is get into a discussion with somebody and it goes into a heated argument over a little tiny gnat of doctrine and you end up swallowing the camel. Okay, they're lost, but they got caught up arguing with you. Okay, and they forgot about the God you're trying to witness uh, to show them. They just forgot about Christ. Okay? <coughs> we got to be careful. Okay? And so to conclude, brother, go to Mark 10. Mark 10. Probably the biggest reason that we find people having this spiritual situation in 2022 is because of the riches we have. Mark 10, I know that's what got me. What do I need God for? I got technology. Yeah. Mark 10 and verse 24. Go to the, the near the end of the verse where it starts out, children, the Lord is talking to his disciples here, and he says, children. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Exclamation point. There aren't that many of those in the Lord's ministry. Pretty important little sentence here if he's got an exclamation point behind it. Okay. Then he says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle 
than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. How many times have we read this and not thought about what I just talked about? Now that makes a little more sense. Okay. It's a little bit. Probably wondering what needle means. That's another, that's another message. Okay. Long story short, needlework was used to embroider the curtains that separated the most holy place from the holy. So if you want to actually get into the most holy place, you might have to stop swallowing candles. That's what I was talking about. Okay. But God said this, and we're thinking about the reality of the tiny eye of a needle and the size of a camel. And we're like, this is impossible, man. Verse 26. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Good question. Okay. Because this is what God is doing with each and every one of us, if you think about it. Pastor was talking about miracles. Every single person that got saved that's born again, that's a miracle. Do you know that? Yeah? It is. He got you to recognize your own pride. Think about that. And he did that without ever crossing your will once. Sorry, Calvinists. Okay? You're wrong. Yeah? Verse 27. And Jesus looking upon them, saying, remember, this is God talking. With men it is impossible, but not with God. You're looking at it. Yeah. For with God all things are possible. And you might sit there and you might be reflecting on this situation and thinking, have I ever swallowed a camel in my life? Yeah. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and that's the first and biggest camel you ever have in your life. Yeah. But you know what God's trying to talk to you? God's trying to show you the reality that He can do the impossible and He can help you recognize that yes, Okay, you're a sinner. Okay. But th that's not the end of it. Okay? He knew that, and while he was your enemy, or while you were his enemy, I should say, he came and died for your sins. And he made a way of reconciliation. And he's extending his right hand of fellowship out to you and saying, stop trying to get through the eye of the needle. Trust me, and I can do the impossible. Yeah. Stop training at the net of your own pride and receive me as your Savior. Because I'm the one that gave you life. Let me give you eternal life. It's a free gift. Okay? Don't get caught up in how good you were. Recognize how good I am compared to you so you can see your condition and wake up. Remember, they were in front of God, these Pharisees. And they all knew that they couldn't convince him of sin once. He convinced him of sin the same time they tried to do it with him. This Johnny. Okay? They all walked away. Okay? So this isn't a situation here where they're not aware. Yeah? Likewise, Christian, you might need to reflect on the reality of what it was like when you got saved. Yeah? Don't think that because God has worked with you for the last 10 years, in my case, many more for many people here, that all of a sudden that you're, you're special and unique. Yeah? And you might start straining at your nets. Yeah? And swallowing some camels. Well, you know, I go to church. I go to church on Sunday twice. Yeah? And I go on Wednesday. I'm the faithful. You know what? Amen. You are doing better than 99% of Christians in America. I'll give you credit. Yeah? In fact, you're doing better than me. Sometimes I can't come on Wednesday. Yeah? But I hope you're not swallowing the spiritual camel as you say that. I hope that this is a situation like Paul where he was forced to act like a fool for a moment because somebody was trying to call him out. That's different. Okay? Than you trying to brag about how spiritual you are. Okay? Or even worse, you get caught up in the cares of this world and strain at all those gnats. Focus on whether you got enough, enough uh, food at the house, you know. Yeah? This bugs me. I was looking for some, what was it, uh, looking for some ruffles this afternoon. I couldn't find any at the house. Turns out my family decided to eat them all. You know what? I was looking for some crumbs. Okay, I was straining. All right? That isn't good. I got over it. Praise God. Okay? We'll figure it out. We'll find a way. You don't want to get caught up in the cares of this world, brother. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Because if we get loaded and stuck on that, and, you know, in my case, let's say promotions come and I'm looking and focusing on that. That's all, that's all I want, okay? I forgot why God put me there, okay? which was in part to witness to people and show them that's not the biggest deal in the universe. See? And so, brethren, I just pray, okay, that, yeah, sometimes you might have some nasty in your life, but don't strain at them, and please don't swallow any camels, amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
Uh, thank you, Lord, for showing us all these little tidbits about gnats and camels. And I just pray, Lord, that you help us recognize our spiritual situation and